front. There are a couple over on the side, and there are a couple against the wall over there. There's one hidden in the corner here. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, what an amazing turnout. This is absolutely wonderful. Uh, we've had some great meetings, but this looks like it might be a record breaker. Uh, this is the part of the program that if it was at the movie theater, you'd say, oh, shucks, if I'd gotten here a few minutes late, I would have missed this part. I'd like to, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, this is a great turnout. Uh, I'd like to Welcome and thank the board, the donors, volunteers. Um, this is a giant team effort. The, the land trust just couldn't do it, couldn't do what it does without donors, volunteers, uh, board members that work very hard. I'd like to thank uh, the town officials and the town council and Tom Hall. They were especially supportive of the Broad Turn Farm, or excuse me, the Benjamin Farm Project. We could not have done it without the Citizens Bond Initiative and the support of the council. Uh, Bill Donovan, who's one of our town councilors, is in the back. Uh, thank you very much, Bill, for your support. Uh, I don't see other state reps or councilors here, I don't think. If, there, if anyone's here, please, uh, please stand up or raise your hand. We, we, have, we have a lot of volunteers, but we have a couple of three special volunteers. Um, we have Diane Neal, who's the head of the Stewardship Committee. Uh, Diane, raise your hand if you're available. She's over on that side. She's done an, an amazing job of pulling together the, the Stewardship Committee. Uh, we have Rita Breton, who's worked tirelessly. She's standing in the back, and she is easily embarrassed. So take a look. Uh, she works tirelessly for development and communications and everything you could imagine. And we have Dawn Piccolo, who's organized the Broad Turn Farm Dinner. Dawn couldn't be here tonight, but she's this amazing invisible dervish that puts this giant dinner together. Um, last year we sold out in a week. We had 160 people attend that, so it was really amazing. Um, our staff is Kathy Mills in the back, who's our full-time executive director. And Sandy Dargy, who's our, our, uh, our IT administrator and database administrator. Sandy's part-time. And, and she knows all the mysteries of our fundraising database, which are significant. We have a new staff member that I'll talk more about later who couldn't attend tonight because she has a, another job and is giving a major presentation tonight. But we have a, a stewardship coordinator that we have just hired, a part-time stewardship coordinator. We recognize that, that stewardship is an area that we really need to concentrate on. Uh, we've, we've done other things that we need to do, and now we're going to concentrate on that. Her name is Teresa Galvin, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about her later. Uh, I'd like to recognize the board members, uh, and I'm not exactly sure where they are. There's Rick Cheney in the back. Uh, Bets Armstrong is here somewhere. Jeremy Winterstein, I'm not sure where he is. There, a bunch of people are outside. And we have, we have one of the things that we need to do in this meeting, we have Melissa Anson, who I see, and I guess everyone else is hiding. Uh, the, right, the, the Land Trust is set up as a membership organization, but for a small organization like ours, it's very difficult for us to keep track of membership things, of sending you your notice once a year and making sure that you have sent your money in and so on and so forth. So what we decided to do several years ago 
was consider that everyone who donates to the land trust in a given year is officially a member of the land trust. And one of the things that we're required to do is to have an election of officers every year for the board of directors. So we have a standing board that's that's been uh, that has been elected, and we have three three new board members. Uh, on the back of your program is the resume of our three newest board members. Two members, Gil Paquette and Melissa Anson, have been serving since just after the board meeting last year, and electing them is a formality uh, that we need to take care of tonight, officially voting for them. And we have a new board member that we've nominated who is Rita Breton. Rita has served tirelessly as a volunteer, and we've been after her for a long time, and she finally, in a weak moment, decided that she'd, she'd join us on the board. Uh, and, and we're really thrilled to have Rita. So I would like to, uh, I don't have a list of the board members who are already sitting, I probably will forget, but we have Rick Cheney, uh Mark Follinsby, Alex Timpson, Jeremy Winterstein, uh, Bets Armstrong, Elizabeth Peoples, who wasn't able to be here tonight, I, who else did I remember? Who? Patrick O'Reilly, and they they have already been nominated. But the three that we we really need to nominate and vote on are Melissa Anson, Gil Paquette, and and our newest member Rita Breton. So I'd like to see a show of hands of donors to the land trust who approve of those nominations to the board. So and. I would say that it's okay, thank you. And then people who aren't donors, maybe if you put up your hands and we get an idea of how many people were really genuine donors. Okay, great. So we have a unanimous vote. Thank you. Um, this has been this has been a very a very, very busy year. Um, it's probably no surprise to any of you who are here that we closed this year finally on the Benjamin Farm after working on it for 15 years. We've had, an, thank you. The the acquisition committee, the acquisition committee, who is Elizabeth, Jeremy, myself, Kathy, Betts, I'm missing someone. Um, it's been a marathon effort, and it, it's the most exciting thing that we've done in a long time. Uh, it was a lot of work, but it was worth every bit of it. Uh, I want to especially thank Elizabeth, who was the project, who was the project leader, and Betts, who was the fundraising chair. We had an amazing, amazing fundraising effort. We raised two and a half times more than I think we've ever raised before. It was just astonishing the support we had. And we're we're just thrilled that the community came behind came behind us on that on that project. Uh, we had we had great support from the council, as I mentioned. We had people who sponsored house parties for their neighbors, and we had a wonderful we had a wonderful campaign committee that met every Monday and and did power stuff all the time. We also uh, had a. a Benjamin Farm, thank you at Camp Ketcha for over 100 donors that came out in a January evening, which was really a nice event. We had a we had a great time, uh, and it was great to see everyone and meet people that we didn't know and and help develop those relationships. We've had two community conversations uh, that are part of our process to get community input as to what what we will do at Benjamin Farm. Of course, we have some ideas. We've been working on this project for 15 years, but we wanted to, to poll the community and find out uh, what what their ideas were. So we're, we're working on tabulating all that information. Um, one of the most exciting things that's come out of this project is that we were able to receive a grant from the Morton Kelly Foundation and from the Horizon Foundation and that allowed us to hire Teresa Galvin, who is our part-time stewardship coordinator. And her work will be 
will focus on Benjamin Farm. She'll be working on developing a neighborhood stewardship committee. Uh, we want to try to use that model to help work on, on the Benjamin Farm project. And we, we're, our intention is to bring her position into, into the budget in three years. Uh, we have two years uh, of support for her and and we're just thrilled because the next the next thing uh, the next thing that we needed to do was to have more formal stewardship uh, more formal stewardship leadership. Diana has done a good job, but she has a very very busy busy life, and it's just really difficult to follow up on things and make phone calls during working hours and so on. So we're we're really excited that Teresa can help us, and she has an amazing amazing background. And you'll all be meeting her in community meetings and and various things. Uh, in the future. I had kidded with Kathy that we need to have a picture of Teresa that we can flash up since she wasn't here, but I guess I guess that didn't happen and Teresa probably would have been embarrassed anyway. Um, in, on the acquisition, not only did we do Benjamin Farm this year, but we've had a few other little successes. Um, Jeremy Winterstein led a project with the uh, Portland Museum of Art and the Prosnack Association to preserve a small piece of property around the Homer studio and the land trust holds the easement on that in perpetuity. It's a really it's a really wonderful sort of a community service sort of a thing that that will help preserve the view from the from the from the Homer studio. Um, that was very much endangered and it's wonderful that we were able to save that piece of property and put an easement on it. So, uh, <clears throat> We, we finally closed on the transfer of, of about 30 acres of the Willie Recreation Area, which abuts Benjamin Farm and Rachel Carson. Um, that was a mitigation parcel that came out of the Wentworth School Project and saved the town about $200,000 because they were able to use that as mitigation, and we took the easement on that. So that was a, 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 really, good, a really good project, too. Um, these little jobs take almost as much as the big ones sometimes. Um, we also added a three and a half or four acre parcel. The Friends of Scarborough Marsh and the Land Trust worked together to to acquire by donation a piece of property that the Janelle family had, and that's been transferred to the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife as part of the marsh. That was a great collaboration between the Friends of the Marsh and, and the Land Trust, and it it's great that we could add one more little piece of property to the marsh. It was a, a, a perfect, a perfect little parcel and that everyone's been interested in for a while. Uh, we celebrated 10 years at Broadturn Farm this year, and we sold out our. We sold out, as I said, we sold out the dinner, and the proceeds of that are going to go towards another barn roof, which is the English barn. And if you were at the, if you were at the dinner, it's the barn where the cocktails and and so on were served. Uh, that's the last roof job, major roof job that we have to do, and everyone keeps telling me that I say that's the last job that we have to do. And, but, but in in reality, it just keeps coming around and around again, like the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, one of the one of the great partnerships that we developed in the last year was with the Piper Shores Wood Shop. And when you see some of these videos, you'll see green signs with white letters. They've made something like 1.2 million signs now, and we only have another we only have another 500 or 600 thousand signs for them to do. And they're just trucking away, routing signs and painting and and decorating and so on. So it's been it's been a great it's been a great project, and they've been wonderful to work with. Um, we're this next year we have we have a bunch of plans. We're finally in a situation where we can take a deep breath and move forward with our, our structure a little bit. Kathy was hired two minutes before our database crashed um, and and left us in a, a giant lurch. Uh, fortunately Sandy and Kathy were able to pull that out of the woods. Then we buried Kathy with with Warren Woods' acquisition, and then we buried Kathy with fundraising and and Benjamin Farm acquisition. So this year we're going to work on some structural things for the organization. We need to work uh, we need to work on building our our financial base. 
we got a great start and we got a lot of new friends with the Benjamin Farm campaign. Uh, it's one of the things that Kathy was, there's one of the signs, and John Peacock and Diane. Uh, so so working on our, our financial support and is very important to us. The land trust is is very, very careful about making commitments. We've We've worked hard to bring Sandy on board without getting in over our heads. We've worked very hard to bring Teresa on board without getting in over our heads. We have now cautiously expanded our office space because we have way more stuff to go in the office than we can, and we were able to we were able to obtain the suite of two offices that's next to our current office. So we will have our current office and a two-room suite. So we'll actually have a place to have small meetings, which we haven't had for quite a while. And in Scarborough, it's really difficult to find a place for small meetings, especially when they bounce around sometimes from week to week. Um, and, and Alpha Management that has donated our small office for the last five or six years um, has given us a break on the, on the new office and also continues to give us the old office. So that's a, a, great, a great bonus for us to have that. Uh, we'll be working on our website this year, and one of our major projects will be working on stewardship for Benjamin Farm. Uh, we want to develop our community stewardship committee. We will be demolishing and taking away the old house, unfortunately. We will be working on a parking lot, a natural resources inventory, so that we know the plants and the and trees and bushes and so on that's on the property, wildlife, that sort of thing. And then we'll be developing more plans for the management of that. Um, I think those are the those are the highlights. And we'll have time for some questions later. I'd like to introduce or bring Kathy up to introduce our speakers. I'm very much looking forward to the program, and Kathy's been interested in this for a while, so I'm pleased that she put it all together. Thank you. Kathy. So we're here to usher in spring, whether you like it or not. Winter is on the way out. We are here to move spring forward, in case you were wondering why you're here. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, you know, the land trust in years past has had, uh, in some instances, had trouble filling 50 seats at its annual meeting, and this is really fantastic. And you know, this really isn't about us. This is really about you and this community and caring about conservation. And for those of us who do this day in and day out and a board who, is, has, who does amazing work as volunteers, it is so satisfying to see there are people here who not just care about conservation, but are committed to it, are suiting up, putting their boots on, and making it happen here in Scarborough. So thank you all very much. Tonight we're going west. We all know and love Scarborough's beautiful beaches, stunning coast, and amazing marsh. They're a big part of what makes Scarborough special. Tonight we're going west to explore the quiet hidden rivers that flow through town. We drive by them and over them almost every day, but we don't really know very much about them. They are another major ingredient in Scarborough's rich natural resources, and tonight we're going to learn a little bit about them. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers who have generously donated their time and expertise for this. Um, though we may be staffing up a little bit at the Land Trust, we still rely on donations and lots and lots of volunteer support like the wonderful um, annual meeting speakers we have here tonight. Um, Rich, Rich Jordan, Grew up in West Scarborough, uh, and appropriately on, on a street named after a wetland, Ash Swamp Road, which is where our Sewell Woods property is located. Rich graduated from Scarborough High in 1993 and from USM in 1999, where he received a degree in environmental science and, and policy. Rich now lives in, in Falmouth and is currently a project manager and consulting biologist at TRC. 
uh, an environmental and engineering consulting company with an office here in Scarborough. Rich has been doing a lot of work at our Warren Woods property for the past three years, and he's currently president of the Maine Association of Wetland Scientists. So this isn't your garden variety wetland scientist. This is the president of the Maine Association of the Wetland Scientists. <laughs> Two more weeks. Two more weeks. Chris Dorian, Chris, is a Maine geologist, soil scientist, and wetland scientist. Received his master's degree from the Quaternary Institute, and I'm sure he'll define what that is, at the University of Maine, Orono, where he studied the glacial history of Maine's blue clays and what the climate was like during a time of rapid geologic change and the arrival of Maine's first immigrants. His geology practice in Portland is based in Portland, focuses on hydrology, and he does a lot of work with municipal, municipalities and private groundwater work. He also works with clients obtaining environmental permits for various projects ranging from homeowners to large wind and energy projects. In the summer of 1993, Chris was the site geologist for the re-excavation of the 1959 Woolly Mammoth site here in Scarborough. It wasn't a myth, it really was for real. <laughs> After that field season, he compiled geologic evidence from numerous sources to reach a hypothesis on the evolution of the early Saco River and the 33-year-old female mammoth's demise. Rich calls Chris one of the smartest guys he knows. Um, we're glad to have them both here. They will talk for about 30 minutes. Then we'll take a few questions before refreshments. And I have just two questions that I hope these guys will answer. Is the Saco Heath part of the headwaters of the Nonsuch River? Question mark. And why is the Scarborough River called a river when it looks like a bay on the map? Take it away, guys. So I can definitely answer one of those questions. The other one may just end up with more questions. Sorry, bear with me one second. This was working 20 minutes ago. Okay, so uh, uh, as Kathy said, she wanted to talk about rivers, rivers in Scarborough, but then, as you know, Kathy gets really excited and keeps talking and keeps adding to the list of things we want to talk about and things people want to know. And so our hidden rivers of Scarborough, these areas that you drive over and may not even know it's a river, grew into, well, what's a watershed? And, and how do these rivers form? And what are people excited about when they talk about rivers? And why shouldn't they, why shouldn't they be even more excited? And it grew. That was my Kathy impression. Um, and uh, as we talked... <laughs> I said, you know, I can't, I can't talk about Scarborough Rivers without talking about the Nonsuch River. I've done a ton of work along the Nonsuch over the years. I know the Land Trust has focused on the Nonsuch River for years. It's, it's a third of the, the watershed of the Nonsuch River is a third of the sound of Scarborough. It's uh, the largest freshwater input to the Scarborough Marsh. It's an incredibly important resource. And I can't talk about the Nonsuch River without bringing in Chris Dorian to talk about some really fascinating things, uh, some work that he did uh, 20 years ago. Uh, along and on such. So, without further ado, I will uh, I will talk about. Whoops, too far. I will talk about these things. Basically, what's a river, um, and what's the big whoop about these things? Uh, what's a watershed? What do the watersheds in Maine look like? What are the six quote rivers? It is six of Scarborough, um, and then uh, Maine's only woolly mammoth. Really? Hmm. Let's talk to Chris about that one. Um, so first off, what's a river? And you know, basically it depends on who you ask. Wh whoever named it last and got it on a map, whether it's a stream, a brook, a creek, a river, a slough, a drain, ditch, um, it's a, there's a couple of definitions out there, but again, they're somewhat fluid. A natural, uh, the dictionary.com, the go-to, of course, for science, uh, is a, uh, a natural stream of water of fairly large size, whatever that means, flowing in a definite course or channel or a series or a diverging, converging channel. So it's either a stream or a channel or several channels. Maybe it's large, maybe it's fairly large. 
Uh, we have a technical definition in Maine under the shoreland zone standards. Um, that it's a water course that drains an area of 25 square miles or has a watershed of at least 25 square miles. And um, to put that into context, the the Nonsuch River isn't technically a river uh, until it crosses Route 1, probably where um, uh, where Humpty Dumpty used to be. For those from Scarborough. Yeah, I am from Scarborough. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's roughly around the Route 1 crossing. Other than uh, north of that, or sorry, west of that, the Nonsuch River is technically a stream according to the state standards. Um, and then if you ask a realtor, they don't like to call things rivers unless you can run a motorboat on it because they feel like it's false advertising. So. Again, it's all over the place, so the fact that there are six named rivers in Scarborough doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot, because, you know, similar, I'm sure you've seen very large ponds and wonder why they weren't called lakes and vice versa. So, so uh, as I was talking about earlier, I mentioned watershed. So what's a watershed? And basically, watersheds, whoops, wrong way. Uh, watersheds, basically, it's, it's a depression in the surface of the earth in, uh, in a point from which, sorry, i got to go the wrong way here, point from which, all the surface water, here we go, that drains onto that area, that hits that area, is going to go in a certain direction. Um, this is a pretty good drawing of it. So basically the watershed in this area for this river here, the watershed is this yellow line, and basically all the water that falls from the, from the sky or all the water that's input into this situ situation, whether it's rainwater or snow melt, is going to drain in a certain direction, ultimately making its way to this river. So zooming in, you have what are called micro watersheds, which are sort of components of the bigger watershed, where again, these lines represent an area that any water that hits here is either going to go this way or this way. Um, and in this case, you can picture, pretend these are red maples, it's a little wetland that feeds a little ditch, which feeds another stream, which has another stream, which forms eventually maybe a creek, uh, which eventually goes into what somebody may call a river. And then again, goes into the larger system where it gets more inputs and eventually makes its way back to the ocean. So what are the watersheds in Maine? Let's start large and then we'll zoom into Scarborough. If you zoom out here, you can look at the 95 corridor, kind of basically running up through the state of Maine. And you go through a lot of large watersheds. These are, these are broken up. A couple of these are for the same river. Uh, I know Kennebec has a couple different sections of this, this, this break, and then the Penobscot has a couple sections. And then as you get all the way up in the Holton area here, you're in the St. John Valley. But, um, this is just basically showing you that any water within these red lines is going to make it ultimately to the large rivers that are that are labeled in in these areas. So again, moving, zooming into Scarborough, in the big picture sense, even when you're in the Nonsuch River watershed, the Nonsuch River is ultimately draining into the Scarborough River or the Scarborough Marsh, which is eventually draining into Casco Bay. So every small watershed drains into a larger watershed, so on and so forth. Eventually, you're in the ocean. So, to Scarborough, um, and again, we had quite a discussion about the five rivers of Scarborough, which Kathy said, no way, there's, no, there's five, there's not six, but I will show you I won out. Uh, <laughs> yes, here's why I'm right. <laughs> I have the microphone, so here's how I'm right. Um, this is a close-up of some of the smaller watersheds within that Casco Bay watershed. This black line represents the the boundary of the town of Scarborough, this obviously is the ocean, um, and this is the marsh. So in Scarborough, you've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven major watersheds that are split up in the town. On the north, we have the Stroudwater, and again, running through a major portion of the town, you have the Nunsuch. Over here is Four River. This line here is Red Brook, which runs out along, uh, out, to, out by uh, Running Hill Road. Um, here is the what they call the Scarborough River watershed, which is which is ultimately the Scarborough Marsh. Um, again, this also drains in the Scarborough Marsh here. Uh, you have Spurwink River watershed over here with the Spurwink River, which is creating the boundary between Cape and Scarborough, and South Portland, yeah. and then uh, then the actual Casco Bay coastal watershed. So in terms of the quote unquote rivers, the named rivers. The Stroudwater becomes the west branch of the Stroudwater at the confluence of these two streams. So for maybe two or three miles, it's actually a river in Scarborough. So we did, we did verify. <laughs> and of course, the Nunsuch. Uh, the Dunstan River um, is a great example of a stream that's called a river. The Dunstan River is fairly small, fairly small watershed. Um, you have the Nunsuch. You have Spurwink, as I mentioned. And then the Libby River, which runs over here, the Land Trust owns Libby River Farm, right along the Libby River. 
And again, Casco Bay, coastal, which is basically meaning all the water in these areas go directly into the bay. So let me zoom out. So one thing we talked about, Kathy, one of Kathy's other questions is this whole area here is the roughly 1,200-acre Saco Heath. Does, anybody, has, does everybody know what Saco Heath is? Has anybody been out there? If you haven't, go. It's amazing. There's a, a really nice boardwalk. You can walk like a mile, I think, into the Heath. It's just an amazing feature out there. Um, as I zoom in to answer Kathy's second question, this is kind of a dark drawing, but this is the Saco Heath. This area right here bounded by no development because it's incredibly wet. Um, and what I didn't know, what we found out as we looked into this, is it's actually, I knew it was super flat, and I knew that it was a portion of the Nonsuch headwaters. What I didn't know is that it's so flat that the center of the bog is slightly raised, and at the center of the heath is slightly raised, and it provides inputs to four different watersheds. All water from the north runs to the Nonsuch drainage. Heading to the east, you go into uh, Cascade Brook, which then you go through the falls, and eventually making its way into the Scarborough Marsh. Uh, to the south, you go Casco Bay Ocean. This basically runs into these smaller tributaries, which run down along 95 and then kick out into the ocean. And then the Saco River over here, um, everything from that point drains to the Saco. Um, I added Stewart Brook here. Um, Stewart Brook is on, uh, what's the name of that part song? Sewell Woods off Ashwamp Road. Uh, Stewart Brook is the, the brook that runs through Sewell Woods and then runs across Broad Turn and ultimately going under a huge culvert on the 95 and then back to the marsh. So that was interesting. So that's two questions answered. <laughs> so my job is done. Um, so again, I wanted to focus a little bit on the Nunsuch River here and you know what's important about the Nunsuch and, and the fact that these yellow lines or these yellow parcels are a combination of conservation land that the land trust has control over, easements over, and town land. But as you can see, they've done a really good job of, of selecting properties and doing, doing some great uh, conservation all along the Nunsuch River, that being such an incredibly important part of the town and a huge part of the, the Scarborough Marsh itself. Um, let me think here. Sorry. One second. I'm going to go through this. Don't, don't look at this for a second because I might make you seasick. Okay. <laughs> So I skipped, the, I skipped the portion here. I'm remembering now as I got here before I go over to Dr. Dorian. Uh, I want to talk about why rivers are important. I jumped to what they are, but here's why they're important. Um, rivers provide us with water. I think we talked about the watersheds. Uh, rivers are incredibly important for maintaining water quality, important for recharging the groundwater, taking groundwater, uh, preventing flooding, getting the water out of situations where it could cause some damage. Um, they're beautiful. Uh, I think everybody understands that. I believe this is the Nunsuch. I can't remember where it is. This is Stewart Brook uh, um, over there off Ashwamp Road. This is in the fall, fresh yet. There must have been a rainstorm recently. I think, it, I think the picture says spring, but I was judging by all the red leaves. This is, this is fall, still on the trees. So. But, um, yeah, that's, that's Sewell Woods. Um, oops, go back. This way, this way. Recreation. Um, <laughs> have a former a retired government employee and his son fishing, um, catching striped bass, probably in a bay fed by Saka River. Um, if you look in his eyes, you can see he'd rather be birding on the Scarborough Marsh. Um, Scarborough River provides, uh, you know, it meets with the ocean at this point, provides an, an incredible habitat for birds and animals, and obviously hugely important to Scarborough's economic development is, is people come here to look at things. People come here to look at animals, look at the marsh. So, um, you know, rivers help provide these great opportunities for other recreation, such as kayaking on the Saco River. Um, coming back out. So speaking of fish, we'll leave them in mind. Um, you know, rivers are obviously incredibly important for wildlife. Uh, the whole, uh, all aspects, all levels of the food chain, um, you know, have, have a foot in rivers at some point in their life cycle or, or, or something they eat. Everything from shell, from clams and snails, uh, biting flies, which are terrible, but also feed a lot of other animals. Um, and right down the beetles, mayflies, stoneflies, larger um, dragonflies, that type of thing that, that feed fish, that, but also that eat the smaller animals we talked about earlier, the biting flies, the mosquitoes. So hugely important uh, in, in the life cycle of these animals. And of course, the smaller animals feed the bigger animals. So we've got these uh, American eel, oops, American eel on top who spend their, uh, they spend their adult life at the ocean, I'm sorry, adult life in rivers and, and they're, they're born in the ocean. And then 
uh, endangered Atlantic salmon. Um, this is alewife, short liver sturgeon, and then, of course, our usually popular brook trout and rainbow trouts all spend their time in streams and rivers. Um, and then other, other predators and scavengers, things like frogs. This is a pickerel frog. They don't necessarily live in rivers or streams, but they'll definitely hunt in them, and they'll use them to stay wet as they move from site to site. This is a wood turtle who just who was in the midst of eating a, a uh, grasshopper when I caught him. Um, he is uh, he's from the Larrabee Farms, the uh, Grandin's Grandin's property over off Beach Ridge Road. Um, found we found three adults. These are special concern species. They're fairly rare in Maine, but they love the Nonsuch River. It's, like I said, I found at least three, maybe four adults. Yeah, so we'll say we'll say four. Um, that northern two-line salamander is a, is a whole host of salamanders that love to breed and eat in, in the small streams. Um, and then, of course, those animals feed these animals. This is a, this is a green heron. Uh, muskrats will live in smaller streams and ponds fed by streams. They, they don't necessarily eat animals, but uh, they use the habitat. Mink and river otters, all eating the fish that are eating the bugs that are eating the frogs and uh, so on and so forth. So to them, the rivers are incredibly important. And um, so if you're still asking the question, what's the big whoop, then I've completely failed and I'll leave. But um, rivers help facilitate the water cycle. They're beautiful. They provide incredible rec recreational opportunities and they provide home and travel corridors for billions of individual creatures and critters. And they support our economy, environment, and sanity. So without further ado, uh, as I said, the not such hugely important aspect of the town of Scarborough and if you didn't know, 20 years ago, there was a re-excavation of a woolly mammoth that was originally excavated in the 1950s, and uh, I, will let, I will let Chris talk more about the development of this. All right, uh, we're going to run in a time machine here back in time. I want to start with the beginning. Sorry, here, out that. I want to start with the beginning of the Nunsuch River. That's what I'm focusing on here. We have to go back. Actually, you know, we're still in the Ice Age. We have an ice sheet in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, it's cold outside, too. <laughs> this is uh, the Antarctic Ice Sheet here, where I spent a season. Um, this is the horizon up here. You're looking at about over two miles, two and a half miles thick of an ice sheet, which is what covered northern North America here. So here's a view of Katahdin and the knife's edge over here. That was just, that's a, Katahdin's a mile high, that was just a speed bump under the ice sheet. And the neat thing is this was all people time. There weren't people in North America yet, but there was uh, Asia and Europe and Africa were all, people were doing their things over there, making instruments and playing music and doing cave paintings and all their things they do. Uh, so it's all within very recent time. Uh, so let's take a two mile thick ice sheet that covered us in Maine. We have to melt it. That's a lot of water. So just to put it in perspective, when the first uh, Paleo Indians were coming over to North America about 11, 12,000 years ago, um, sea level was almost 360 feet lower than today. That's the entire Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean. All the oceans were dropped them 360 feet. That water was stored on land. And in just a few thousand years, it all went back. I mean, people are seeing sea level rise of 30 feet a year at times. It's amazing when the great, great glacial lakes burst. So, um, so which is the arrow here? OK, great. So. We're going back in time, but we don't really have to. We can go to Greenland. And I spent a week in the Greenland ice sheet here on the west coast of Greenland. This is a really good analog or analogy or comparison to what it was like in Maine. And this is when people were here, the first settlers were arriving, and this is what they looked at, um, if you can imagine that. There's a person here for scale. So notice the, uh, it's melting, but it also grows in the center too many, many kilometers away. Um, so let's, let's look at one more picture of the Greenland ice sheet. And here it is melting even. This is at the peak. This is the end of July. This is how what happened in Maine. This was the start of all our river systems. They started as glacial meltwater streams. 
And one other thing, too, if you look at over here, this is the ice sheet here. And look at the variability here. There's everything from house size boulders to silt and clay to sand to gravel. And you may understand now a little bit why our soils are so variable in Maine, even within just tens of feet walking across a property. Um, you can see amazing changes. So let's go to, um, once again, back in time, the Greenland ice sheet here. There are muskox. There's three of them here. One, two, three, another four of them if you see them there. And if you notice on the right-hand picture, this is a grassland right up against the ice sheet. That's what it looked like here in Maine. No trees on the landscape. Really easy to walk around and make time hiking. Very easy without a forest. And the other thing, too, is that this guy, Dale Guthrie here, he termed this the mammoth steppe. And a steppe, of course, is a prairie or a... Um, plain or a savanna or Serengeti, it's grasses meant for grazing animals, big grazing animals. And unfortunately, we don't, it's gone today. It's no longer on earth. We don't have a cold uh, steppe anywhere on earth. And that's why we lost all our great North American uh, animals, big animals, such as the mastodon, the mammoth. We had the American cheetah, we had the American lion, we had camels, we had horses, giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats. It looked like Africa here when the Paleo-Indians were coming over, if you could imagine. Just an amazing place, great cool plains with these, basically it looked like a, a safari you'd, you'd take in Africa. So here's the, um, one of the mammoths. This was recovered in the uh, permafrost in Siberia, uh, baby mammoth. This is what they look like. They had beautiful red hair. Um, and the interesting thing is when they look at the stomach contents, the stomachs were full, but they died of starvation because the grassland was taken over by a forest, and these are not browsers like deer and moose, which can digest woody vegetation. These were grazers. They have to eat grasses. So that's an interesting um, part of it. Here's a full-grown one. So the reason... Um, we're getting now back to uh, um, the nonsuch. And once upon a time, Scarborough looked just like this. <laughs> this would have been the nonsuch river valley, except it's flat all the way across. It's completely filled with sand and gravel, absolutely completely. The ice sheet is over here to the right. It's about, oh, six miles away. And it's discharging this meltwater full of sediment, absolutely full sand, gravel, silt, clay, and these are called outwash plains. You have to remember that name, okay? Not hard. Um, if you notice, this is all beautiful sand and gravel. Out here, the water is mur murky colored. It's full of silt and clay particles, very fine, the, the, very, the stuff that stains your clothes. That is becoming, when it reaches the ocean and the salt water, it binds together and becomes blue clay. So how many of you know what the blue clays of Maine are? Oh! <gasps> you have something to look for now. If you dig underneath, Scarborough's basically covered with about 15 feet of sand. If you dig a hole under, through the sand, you come upon blue clay, sticky, gooey, just water-saturated. Um, you'll see it in fresh excavations, but it's covered over quickly because it's really hard to work with. It turns to soup and jello when you disturb it. Um, so those are the blue clays of Maine. Uh, the major cities, Bangor, Lewiston, Augusta, all the bricks, brick buildings, Saco, those bricks were all made from blue clay. So you see, every time you see old brickyard road or the brick, those were all huge, huge brickyards up until about 1910 or 11, 12, 13, 14. Huge business in Maine, right up there with ice. Um, and they make that beautiful orange brick, which you can't get anymore to match the old brick. But it's the, our blue clays. So, all right. Let's, uh, this is it. Looking down, an air photo, um, 1975. <laughs> this is the Holmes Road, Beach Ridge Road, Mitchell Hill Road here, Broad Turn Road here. And if you look very carefully, this is the Nunsuch is running in this valley right here. And if you notice, there's a, very, there's a shadow here. It's a, a very large channel. The Nunsuch is a, basically a tiny, tiny 
little stream. It has nothing to do with this massive valley. It just happens to be there by chance. So I had the greatest opportunity in 1993 to figure out why this huge valley is here with this tiny little stream in it that had nothing to do with making the big valley. So here's the Scarborough Mammoth site here. This is now the Fengler um, subdivision development. Fengler Road, yeah, Fengler Road there. So I worked right here, and these blue lines, there's one on each side of the valley, indicate the outwash plain that I showed you in the last slide, right there. So here we go, I've superimposed on here Mitchell Hill Road over here. And this is what it looked like when the mammoth was doing her thing. Um, over at Salmon Falls, people know where that is? Yeah, okay, Salmon Falls. Um, the glacier left a big pile of debris. It blocked the glacial meltwater, this meltwater, and diverted it into what is now the Nunsuch River Valley. So you had a huge amount. The ice sheet, you know, you got this two-mile thick ice sheet draining, a good part of it's draining into the Nunsuch. And obviously, it filled the entire valley with sand from from valley wall to valley wall. This would be Mitchell Hill and Beach Ridge to the north. So this is, that's a pretty good, pretty good analogy there. So here we are. This was in 1993, sponsored by the Maine State Museum. My former, my master's advisor, Harold Borns, was the one that really initiated this dig. Um, in 1959, uh, Leonard Cash and William Littlejohn, Littlejohn owned the property here, which the Fengler subsequently purchased. Uh, they were digging a water supply pond here and pulled up a tusk and some other parts of a woolly mammoth. Uh, people, the next, it came out in the papers a couple of days later, people were coming at midnight trying to pot the site and look for bones. So they came up with this story that, oh, no, no, it wasn't a woolly mammoth. It was Old Bet, the circus elephant from Portland that had been buried here, and it was just a, <laughs> just a circus elephant. So that ended that. But... The kind of the momentum at that point ended and it went until the uh, 1993 excavation. And now remember I talked about the blue clays, blue clays under the sand. This is basically Scarborough, sand over blue clay. When you dig down, usually the water table sits on here and correct me, it's um, Wamaski Springs, what are they? Wasamki Springs. They basically mined out the sand, and you're basically right on the blue clay, so it's all big water table there. And the blue clay, if you take a hose to it and spray it down um, and look at it carefully with the hand lens, you'll see all kinds of shells and marine critters that live in the ocean. Everything from there's ostracods, foraminifera, these are bivalves, clams, everything. The only thing is they don't live around here anymore. They live up in the Arctic because it was really, really cold. Something similar to the Beaufort Sea north of Alaska today. That was a good analog to it. But so this mammoth was, um, when, they were, when, uh, when uh, Little John and Cash were digging with backhoe, they, um, it came from the top couple feet of the blue clay here. The blue clay is neat. It preserves, I mean, you've got, these shells are 14,000 years old. And they look as fresh as what you find on the beach today. There's seaweed in there. You can't distinguish it from seaweed you pick up on the beach. Wood, trees, trunks, green spruce needles, um, mammoth parts and bones. So here's the, um, this is uh, actually the tusk up here. And if you count the growth rings, here's the pulp cavity where it was attached to the head. And you count 33 of these cone-shaped concentric growth rings. So the mammoth was 33 years old. The pulp cavity is very small, so it's a female. The male pulp cavity is much, much larger. This is one of the molars, and you can see it was designed for grazing, for, for eating grasses. It doesn't have the occlusal surfaces that our teeth have with the big incisors and canines for ripping meat and, and so forth. But um, it's a little disappointing. The, um, that was four ribs were found, part of the skull, one tusk and two molars, that was it. So people then started looking to me, Chris, where's the rest of the mammoth? We have, Channel 13 was there. <laughs> so it was about, it was the hottest summer, it was 90 degrees, the deer flies around, and I'm like, uh, I 
Part of my job was to come up with a story. What, where's the rest of the mammoth? And it, it wasn't what people wanted to hear. <laughs> it was a sad story. So we've seen the pictures of the outwash planes. Our poor departed Harriet, she died in the winter upstream on the outwash plane and was heavily scavenged. I mean, we, when an animal dies, they get, there's not much left after a week or two. Uh, so all the connective tissue to the legs, the big bones, that was all gone. They were dragged off. Uh, in the spring or summer when the meltwater started up again, the partial carcass was most likely carried down the um, meltwater that was running in the Nunsuch Valley, and the carcass was dumped into the ocean. And remember now, I told you in the first slide that the ice sheet here was how thick? Okay, that's a lot of weight. It's like almost 90% the density of water, so it's like being down in the ocean about you know 6,000 feet. The pressure will squeeze a submarine into a tin can. So there's so much weight on the land, it pushed the land down so the ocean looked like it rose up. And we were actually impounded here. Most of Scarborough was just part of, uh, was under, underwater. It's up to 270 feet. So that's why we have blue clay everywhere in Scarborough and sand everywhere. But as we know, the weight was taken off. It's like unloading a ship. The ship starts to bounce back. And it, when it bounces back, it looks like the waters, the ocean's receding. The ocean drops. And that's about the time the mammoth got dropped. The ocean had dropped to 155 feet. It's dumped into the uh, near shore, the blue clays. Wave action, storms, nor'easters. The mammoth is incorporated in the top couple feet of the blue clay. And there it stayed until 1959. So here's a quick uh, cross section of the, um, here's the, uh, let's look, this is the Holmes Road to the southeast and the Burnham Road to the northwest. So this is just like, as if you took a slice across the Nunsuch Valley. Way down here, there's a little tiny, tiny stream, piddly stream called the Nunsuch River, which um, obviously did not carve this huge valley here. The mammoth site is over here at the top of the blue clay. Here's the yellow beach sand on top of everything. And the outwash here, the, um, when the, when the uh, stream actually became a river, it basically what we call disemboweled the valley. It took all that sand and took it out into Casco Bay. And there's huge deposits of sand out in Casco Bay that were originally filling this valley, making it flat across here. And that likely happened right about 10,500 years ago when the first settlers were coming to Maine. Uh, because remember, as I said, we, we're lifting that weight off the land. The land is bouncing back up like a, coming up like a cork. And what happens, as you know, when you raise the level a stream wants to get to, it wants to cut down to that level. It wants to down cut as hard as it can. And it down cut right through Salmon Falls and established the modern course of the Saco River. And there the Saco River remains to this day. And the Nunsuch was cut off and is just, as Rich said, it's just receiving um, local water, rain and snow melt from its small watershed. So, and I guess we're up for uh, questions. Okay. I wanted to know where the um, mammoth parts, they're accessioned at the Maine State Museum in Augusta, and the tusk is on display with some of the ribs and the molars. Uh, first floor, with some other, there's some walruses from other blue clay, from other the Brewer brickyards up in Brewer uncovered several um, Arctic walruses too from the same era. Oh, yes. Excellent question. So we know they were grazers. They lived on grass. They needed. They drank a huge. It's just like an, it's the same as an elephant. It's the same family. There's no difference really. Um, elephants. A mature elephant will eat, you know, 50 pounds of forage a day, and they drink. I don't know how many gallons of water. They have to live on those outwash plains. That's their preferred 
habitat. So in Maine, their range was constricted. You had the ice sheet just to the north, and you had the ocean to the east. Uh, and so they were, and the, they weren't climb, they weren't mountain climbers. You had the mountains to the, the western mountains. So they were really restricted to York County, Cumberland County, especially these the outwash plains. So you would need to dig, especially where there are depressions, like the one here at the when the um, Little John was digging his water supply pond. But um, we have very strict wetland regulations <laughs> about <laughs> digging in the bottoms of peatlands, which is where most of the the critters ended up in in Maine. So, but it is unusual. You think with all the you know construction going on, the Turnpike and the I-95s, and uh, that more would be found. But um, you really got to get on those outwash plains, the river valleys, and in just in very southwestern Maine. Yes. Well, they're not poisons. You know, fertilizer goes into your some of the bottled water as a gives it a little bit of taste, magnesium sulfate, magnesium chloride, and it's so you know in a small amount it's fine. And uh, um, everything, as they say, you know, moderation in everything. So, and you, but that'd, that'd be a whole other talk. <laughs> Any? Yep. <laughs> what, what, and you know, our, our primary orientation is typically the, the ocean and the marsh. What are, what are some of the key threats to sort of the health and vitality of these rivers that are in our town? You know, is it, is it lawn fertilizer? Is it salt? Is it development? What, what should we be thinking about when we want to care about the health and vitality of these river, rivers? Rich. <laughs> I could try. I mean, the short answer is yes. Sorry, the short answer is yeah. I mean, it's all of those things. It's it's development. It's encroachment. I mean, one thing I did mention I didn't talk much about was the the whole idea of corridors. It's less of a water quality issue, except for the buffering. But in terms of of, of critters that are moving along these rivers, moving along the forested areas next to the rivers, um, you know, as you develop obviously against those areas, you have less cover, you have less forage, you have less habitat. So you start to start to remove some of the protection for the for the wildlife. Obviously, as you clear your vegetation closer to the river, you have a lot more opportunity for runoff, not just for pesticides, herbicides, um, and uh, fertilizers, but silt, sediment, sand. Um, you know, it's a natural process, as Chris eloquently described, but uh, when, uh, when, when, when done in a non-natural system, um, it can, you can add a lot of excess nutrients that the system may not be able to deal with. So you get things like algal blooms in some of the wetlands, and it can speed up the growth and, and spread of invasive species. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a host of all kinds of things. It's not just development. It's bad development. It's not just roads. It's roads with culverts that are too small. It's not, you know, it's always sort of a host of things and a suite of things. So I think just being aware, and, and, and I mean, Scarborough's light years ahead of a lot of communities in terms of zoning and, and, and basically just the environmental, uh, you know, acumen of the boards and of the volunteer system. So, and we have a hundred and something people here tonight sort of highlight that fact. But, but that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of things, nothing simple, as hopefully we learned. As, as, as simple as Chris put that, it's incredibly complex. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. I graduated the year he set that up, yeah. Oh, oh I thought you meant personally. <laughs> it's only a few years older than me. Uh, no, um, I, I mean, I really don't know. I don't, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, uh, the, the, let me go back. The USGS has long-term monitoring wells. They've been studying for 20-something years. They look at the level of the water table. As you know, not far beneath, sometimes right in your basement is the top of, <laughs> especially in about three weeks, <laughs> that is the top of the water table, which is 
sort of an analogy would be a lake, and it goes down about 3,000 feet into the earth through all the soil, then into the bedrock. The bedrock saturate. All the fractures and openings in the bedrock are fractured. That water table over the last seven years is rising. So there are huge implications for not just your own home's basement, but for roads, foundations, um, all kinds of, of, of issues. We've had much, much wetter seasons, especially in the late fall when most of the rain is recharging. It's not being taken up by the trees. Uh, you know, a mature deciduous tree takes up about transpires about 75 gallons a day of water. Once they go into uh, dormancy in the fall, that rain and is right straight into the water table. We're getting very heavy rains in the springs and falls. So that's um, and of course you're going to have higher flows in rivers and streams, obviously, because those are draining. That's the top of the water table, by definition. The stream surface river surface is the top of the water table and ultimately the ocean is everything is tipped. Never forget water flows downhill. <laughs> uh, I think she had, uh, what kind of soil do the farms of Scarborough have? I haven't been on the Benjamin farm. Um, you can actually go online now to the uh, Soil Data Mart, and you can look at the exact. There are all kinds of funny names like just Sun Cook and Elmwood and and Masardis, and um, you have to read the description of the. And it's a, there's a great online access to that. But um, basically, as I said, we have uh, sand covers a huge amount of Scarborough, uh, so you have very light soils, easy to till. Um, they tend to have a topsoil on top. It's been worked. If the farm's been there for 200 years, it's been manured, hopefully limed, and it's got, it's pretty good soil. The problem we have in Maine with ag soils is we get so much rain and snow, it, it flushes a lot of the, especially the calcium, magnesium, potassium gets flushed out, and the soils tend to become acid and infertile, so that's why you have really got to put the lime to it in the organic matter. But. I think the other cool thing Chris pointed out with the outwash, the the esker coming off, the, the drainage coming off that uh, that melting glacier is the the heterogeneous nature of the soils that are that are spilling out in that situation. It's similar here, which you go into a you go into a farm field that's been around for 200 years, and they all have piles of rocks. <laughs> but you can plow; you don't necessarily hit rocks. They just come up every year. But it's the same thing that you've got a fairly homogeneous sort of soil, but all of a sudden you've got a year where a bunch of rocks come up, and sort of just the way they was laid down over the years. Pretty interesting. Sorry. If there's one more question. Zip. The turnpike. <laughs> <laughs> No, I've I've talked about I've talked about doing this from Beach Ridge Road down for about ten years. I just haven't done it, but you need to bring a buck saw and some some uh, some wet boots and um, bug spray. No, I mean I think there's a lot of crossings, where most of the crossings are elevated bridges. So I think you could probably get under, if not, you could portage. You could make it, but like I said, it would it would you would go slow. It's really overgrown. There's a lot of there's a lot of wind throw and and dams and little uh, side channels. Um, I've walked a lot of it, but I've never I've never gotten up the gumption to bring my boat out. No, I think like natural debris dams. You get storm stuff falls in and flushes down until it catches up. So. One last question is Matt: Is how many people have paddled around in some of the rivers in Scarborough? This is good. So it's not all foreign territory to everybody. They're not so hidden. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. We just have quick gifts for Rich and Chris. Your very own Scarborough Land Trust tote bag. And now you're an official card-carrying member with your own mug. And. Um,
and we couldn't let you go without a picture of the Nonsuch River. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, we do have some goodies and refreshments. Stay and visit with your fellow friends and neighbors who care about conservation. Events coming up, um, folks who are SLT people remind me, uh, Saturday, May 2nd, we will certainly put the word out before that, will be our spring cleanup on our properties. Um, we are digesting all of the input from the uh, Benjamin Farm community conversations and we will be sharing a little bit about that with you as we go and make plans for the property. What, what else am I forgetting for events? Oh, I think we're going to have a fundraiser at the autos, the hidden autos in South Portland um, later in April. Um, check our website or e-news. Anything else? I th oh. Uh, I wanted to thank Rachel. Oops, sorry. Rachel Carr in the back there, I want to say thank you. She made most of my maps. So, <laughs> Rachel, Rachel also works for me. Thanks again to Rich and Chris, and thank you all for coming. Please stay in and enjoy. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was good. A lot of questions.